Okay, so I, I want to uh, again thank uh, Elsa and G Gonzalo for uh, a, the very pleasant uh, period of time we've had here and look forward to our future uh, collaborations with them. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to follow on. David has now set the large stage for, for what the, uh, this question is, is all about. And clearly, we're now at the point at which we need metrics by which we measure performance. Uh, the, the organisms that we've been looking at are all organisms that I would describe as being ecological engineers, which actually is a term that I, I truly hate, but uh, we seem to be stuck with it in the literature, so I'll just deal with it. So ecological engineers are usually described on the basis of how much of the resource for a habitat they, they utilize, how important they are trophically, uh, whether they're uh, in terms of organisms like barnacles, whether they occupy all of the, all of the surface in a particular tidal zone, uh, what what they are uh, relative, how their relative importance in terms of resource base, uh, in 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 many habitats, a very important description of of an ecological engineer is habitat modification. One of the reasons for looking at uh, Diapatra on the European coast, and also of course uh, Arenicola is because they are major modifiers of sedimentary habitats. In one case, they are stabilize the habitat. In the other case, they are uh, major uh, organisms that turn over huge amounts of sediment in the, into the habitat. And the usual ways in which we look at organisms, particularly in sedimentary habitats, in terms of their role as controlling the rest of the assemblage, which is what all of e the term ecological engineer is supposed to imply, so controlling the rates of of recruitment of organisms, their success in terms of growth and reproduction, their even uh, perhaps even their their presence at all, but certainly their success in the habitat is is in terms of these sorts of things. And so, in sediments, usually we're talking about increases in the ease of erosion, organisms that do that, organisms that decrease the ease of erosion, organisms that turn over sediments, such as uh, Arenicola, organisms that. Uh, the, the one characteristic that we typically have not talked about, but we are beginning to talk about a lot, uh, an enormous uh, amount now, is the degree to which there are hydraulic activities associated with that organism. So I'm going to concentrate in the talk today about performance as a function of hydraulic activity, and the reason for concentrating on that is number one, we're going to do some of that here. So Gonzalo will have pressure sensors in the lab and you can go take a look at these homemade affairs and be not probably very impressed by them, but they're actually yield very interesting data. Uh, but also because it turns out that this in fact may be one of the most important characteristics for organisms living in sediments as to what's going on in terms of controlling the rest of the assembly. <coughs> And in terms of organisms on the European coast, two of the organisms that are disappearing from the south are beginning to show indications of that. One is, uh, is, is uh, Aranicla in parts of the Bay of Biscay, and the other is Macuma baltica, a uh, Talinid bivalve, which has already moved north out of uh, uh, the southern regions of the, of the Bay of Biscay, as shown by, by uh, the, the Dutch. So here's just examples of, of what you see in surfaces. This is a cutaway slide stolen from Rhodes and Young in the 70s. This is what happens to the sediment when you have increased uh, mobility of bioturbators and increased uh, resuspension going on. Uh, this is the same sort of thing in that when you have a, a relatively sedentary bioturbator which just turns over sediment. This is what Aranicola or many thalassinids do, for example. Uh, and then you have sediment stabilizers. This is uh, Lenisi, which you certainly are quite familiar with. This is a Diapatra neapolitana, the tube of it, plus uh, in a zostra bed. These are organisms which are sediment stabilizers, so they're, they're the opposite. So why should I care about uh, hydraulic uh, activities? Well, all macrofauna, all organisms that live in sediments, all their movements are via hydraulic activities. This is how the organisms, uh, this is how they burrow. They inject water into the sediment. This is how they live in, in uh, structures in the sediment. Uh, bivalves, for, for example, uh, do a tremendous amount of injecting water into the sediment, both in terms of, of uh, when they blow the, when they clean off the labial palps in front of the mouth, which they do frequently about once to, to a minute to every uh, two minutes. 
there's a little jet of water that, that comes out of the abyssal gape and goes into the sediment. So those are actual uh, changes in the water dynamics in the sediment as a function of the organisms. Some organisms do more of this than others. All of you, I'm sure, have gone to a sediment, dug in it for something, uh, for a clam or whatever, and you've seen these sort of oxygenated burrow traces of organisms in the sediments that are very common. And those are reflections of the organism bringing water from the overlying water down into the sediment and affecting the physical properties of the sediment as a, conse as a consequence. This is just a movie of an arenicolid polychaete in a, in a clear plastic tube showing you the peristaltic event of an arenicolid. An arenicolid feeds through using its peristalsis to in fact create a quicksand column in the front of its mouth at 20 to 25 centimeters in the sediment. Every pulse forward towards its head injects a bolus of water into the sediment. In general, we can detect those injections up to 30 centimeters away from the individual. So an individual is, is now affecting a, has a sphere of influence, 30 centimeters in every direction around, around itself at a depth of 20 to 25 centimeters. Its poop pile, which is what we typically look at on the surface and think that's its effect, is about, depending on the size of the individual, uh, three to six centimeters in diameter. Now, significantly, significantly less. Um, we can look at these, uh, the effects of the degree to which these organisms are doing these sorts of things, by asking, by measuring the pressure of the water in the sediment. <coughs> the, uh, so a, uh, when, you, when you inject water into the sediment with a syringe, for example, you increase the pressure of the pore water, the water that's between the sedimentary grains. <coughs> that increase in pressure can be measured by, uh, by what's basically a force transducer, and so it, it sees that pressure change. And in seeing that pressure change, it creates a voltage which we can record. The changes in voltage, interestingly enough, turn out not only to be measurable, but the, the waveforms uh, created by those changes relate to the organism's behaviors. So by looking at the waveform, we know what the organism's doing. So for somebody like me, who spent a very long time working in sediments and been frustrated by the fact that all I ever see is the surface of the sediment with you know, stuff that happens occasionally. Uh, I know Aranicolids poop about every 25 minutes because Wells showed that in the 40s and I, and distressingly enough, have also shown it. But the, uh, in those 25 minute periods, what happens in between? I don't know. With pressure sensors, I now know. Uh, I can look at them both with pressure sensors. We can also visualize them with oxygen optodes. Oxygen optodes are a, uh, it's a, it's a material which uh, um, fluoresces, and the fluorescence is quenched by the presence of oxygen. So when the organism pumps water into the sediment, you see a, you see a, uh, a, a change in the fluorescence from the aptode, which you can measure. You can't do that in the field, but you can do well. You can now do it in the field, uh, but mostly this is a laboratory technique. And so you can confirm that what you think is going on, the animal's injecting water into the sediment, is actually going on by looking for the presence of oxygen in the sediment of an aptode. So I've said all these, well, I have said several of these things. So what the reason for being interested is they're common to all the infauna. They're not equivalent to sediment turnover. And importantly, if you're thinking about the, what's going on in sediment in terms of, of uh, the availability of oxygen, the importance of, of nutrients to things like the, the microphytobenthos on the surface of the sediment, pumping of water into the sediment forces poor water out. That poor water is depleted in oxygen, but it's enriched in things like ammonium and also in carbon. And that's probably a major source of nutrients for the microphytobenthos. And we've in fact seen some, we have some data that suggests that that absolutely is true. The other thing you're doing, of course, is from the, for the microbial world, you're changing the electron acceptors that are available. Uh, so you're switching them from something really not very useful as an electron acceptor, not very energetic genetically valuable as an electron acceptor to something much more valuable as an electron acceptor. And uh, finally and importantly, you change the chemical taste of the surface without turning over the sediment because you're expressing pore water, which has a very, very different chemical signature than the overlying water. <coughs>
because it is depleted in oxygen and rich in ammonium. And so there are all sorts of implications, which I won't talk about. And so then how do you collect these data? Well, this is the, the collection device in the field uh, with its cables going to these things. These are the pressure sensors. And so we can record these activities in the field. And I've said, well, as I've said, we see a pressure waveform, which I'll show you in just a moment. Uh, we also can record these activities in the, uh, in the laboratory. In the laboratory, we film the organisms under conditions where we can see what the organism is doing. So we put them in the artificial situation of a thin aquarium. We film through the, through the side of that aquarium. So you have sediment in the aquarium. You film the animal inside. You know what it's doing because you look at the images and you see when it's burrowing, when it's injecting water, uh, when it's defecating. Um, it's the ultimate in reality TV in a sediment. And so you then can, because everything is time synchronized, you then can ask from those videos what waveform is associated with what behavior. And if you always see a particular waveform associated with a particular behavior, then you know that you can search the pressure records and you know the frequency of the, of the behavior. So you can, you can build a, an, a record of, of behaviors and ask that question. So in terms of physiological performance, you can ask, if you stress the animal, does the frequency of these behaviors change? And what does that mean? You know, does feeding change, for example? Does this mean that, in fact, the organism is feeding a much a significantly reduced period of time? Is it, in fact, increasing its burrowing, which is, in fact, enormously expensive in terms of work? Does it change those behaviors in those ways, which would result in changes in distribution? So that's what the laboratory looks like. We're really pretty bad in the lab, lots of stuff. Uh, so these are the pressure sensors in the lab with captive animals in here. Their camera is recording what's going on on the surface. Here's another set of organisms. This, is, this pink stuff is the uh, oxygen-sensitive uh, uh, fluorescent material. It's being recorded on this, um, this camera, which uh, uh, takes a whole series of images in a very short period of time with, uh, with a, uh, a sensitive uh, lens. So think about, uh, let's, let's talk about organisms for a moment. Here's a Macoma nasuda, which is a West Coast equivalent of Macoma balfica. So this, is, this is from the Pacific Northwest of the United States. This is sped up, it's about sped up three, uh, 30 times, so the animals aren't really this active. And so what you're seeing is the surface, uh, the, the incurrent siphon of a bivalve feeding on the surface, uh, taking a material, then it disappears, and then you'll see little bumps along the surface. Is, see that, all these little bumps? That's what's happening is the animal is injecting water in front of its siphon in order to move its siphon in the subsurface. So it's actually making little water jets which cause it to a, a, cause a, 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 a tunnel in the subsurface to open up and allows the organism to, uh, to move its siphon. Each one of those little water jets appears as an increase in pore water pressure. So notice that we're not seeing the X current siphon. In almost all telinids, not, not universally, but almost all of them, you only see the in current siphon. That's because the X current siphon is in the subsurface. So the organism is indeed doing the typical bivalve thing of water comes in, the in current goes through the gills, up throughout, back to the other side of the mantle cavity and up the, up the uh, X current. But instead of the X current being up here, the X current in fact is several centimeters below the sediment surface. What that means is that water passage is into the sediment. So as the animal feeds, it pressurizes the sediment. So we can detect uh, not only the siphon movement, but we also can detect the uh, uh, change in um, uh, poor water pressure as a function of feeding. So here's an animal that very kindly built its uh, excurrent siphon hole right along the edge of an aquarium, so we filmed it because we're the ultimate in voyeurs. Here's the incurrent siphon of the, of the clam. The body is over here somewhere in the sediment. And notice all the little fecal pellets. So it's actually got a whole uh, structure here of little fecal pellets that it's actually, uh, it defecates, there's a big explosion event when it defecates, uh, but it, uh, mo many of them end up in this channel between the surface and the subsurface that goes to the excurrent siphon. But notice the sediment is sort of rising up and down in this channel at various moments, and that's because as the animal pumps, it's pushing water into the sediment and also pushing water up through this channel. 
So again, we can measure those characteristics by uh, pressure sensors. So two organisms of interest, the arenicolid polychaete. So here's a field of arenicolid uh, poops from um, uh, north, the north coast of Spain. Uh, this is a, a field of, of surface traces of feeding of, uh, of a telinid, uh, again, from the Pacific Northwest, but Macoma balthica makes tracks very much like this. And, and so what you see in these diagrams here is here's a arenicolid, which is sitting uh, tail up, head down. This is its defecation mound that you see on the surface. And it brings water in, and its peristaltic movement is out the head area, increasing, increasing the uh, uh, pore water pressure and the sediment around it. Here's the, the uh, Macoma uh, uh, species, this telinid, pulling in water in the in-current siphon, goes through the, the gills and so on, and then comes out the X-current several centimeters below the surface, again, creating an increase in pore water pressure. So this is what the recordings of the pressure sensors look like. These are uh, in centimeters of, centimeters of water. Um, and uh, baseline pressure in these setups is where the red line is here. And this looks enormously complicated. This is a very compressed record because in this case, we we're showing you about 180 minutes and here it's about 900 minutes. If we expand that and look at uh, what that uh, looks like. So here's just a snapshot of an image for a telinid. Here's again baseline. So I said there were little jets of water. Here are the little jets of water created by the organism uh, moving its siphon forward. Here's another case where it was moving its siphon forward. When it feeds, it increases the pressure in the, in the sediment by about, in this case, about half a centimeter of, of, of water. And then there's a cough as it blows off uh, pseudofeces, as is typical of, of, uh, of bivalves. And then it goes back to feeding again. So you get these kind of peculiar looking rectangular waveforms that are associated with feeding. Very easy to tell apart from the siphon movements, very easy to tell apart from, uh, from coughing or from burrowing. Here's another telina. This is a Macamona uh, species from New Zealand. This is the uh, compressed record, and then we've expanded these sections. So here it is, the animal's burrowing, and this is what burrowing looks like. Looks very different from feeding. This is feeding, so here's feeding here in the compressed form. Here is in the expanded form. And you see again these little rectangular, uh, rectangular uh, periods. Again, the red is is uh, is baseline. So that's what pressure sensors do for you. They allow you to spy on the organism. They allow you to ask what the frequency of the behavior is. They ask. They allow you to ask the question under conditions of of less stress, more stress, different sediment types, all those kinds of questions uh, that you would really like to be able to do for an organism. So that actually most of its behavior you can't see. And now, basically, you can. Um, if you do this for, I'm now going to be delayed because I didn't do this in time, but we'll wait a minute. So I'm looking at Macamona burrowing. This is the organism I just showed you the trace of. And on this lower panel, uh, so the organism is, is moving around in the sediment. There is its siphon. Here's its X current siphon. Um, and then in a minute, this tape is going to restart, restart again. So we started this tape at a time when it was, it was burrowing, so we get these signals. Then it, then it gets into the sediment, moves around a little bit. Okay, so if I, if I were faster, there we go. So the, there it's burrowing. This is the oxygen optode. See the, the, what looks like a rise in sediment here? That's actually not a rise in sediment. This is where the, the optode is. It's not, sediment's not going up and down. What's going up and down is the surface relative to the anoxic layer of water, and that's because the animal's creating poor water pressure that pushes low oxygenated high ammonium water out of the sediment. And we see that as what appears to be a rise in the, uh, in the sediment layer in, this, in the image, but it's, that's false. If I were to put the, the line for where the sediment is, the sediment actually is about there, and you'll see this, see this rise. And now look what also is happening, you see these little these, these tendrils of, of purpley water coming out. That's poor water being expressed out of the sediment. It's actually cracking, causing cracks in the sediment, gaps to the surface, pushing water out. 
So you can see the activities of the organisms here in a very dynamic way. So you can see that with Aranicola. Here's a, a film of, of Aranicola. These are actually available online um, at the, uh, because we've, this is, these films were part of a paper we published in 2010 in, in LNO. Uh, so this is a Aranicolid. Here's its poop pile over here. And you see these really nice tails of, of, uh, of poor water. This is a, ver this is a, a, a fine muddy sand. So uh, a relatively low hydraulic conductivity sediment. Uh, this is a much more porous sediment. This is a sort of medium to fine sand, much higher, higher permeability and hydraulic conductivity. In this case, we see the oxygen input at depth all the time as the organism pumps forward. Uh, and we see water coming up onto the surface as a continuous sheet. So this is one of the changes you see as a function of what sediment you put the organisms into. It's really, that's actually really an interesting part of this. It tells you a lot about how hard it is to be an organism of this type in these kinds of, in different kinds of sediments. So that's the reason why um, hydraulic activities are, are really so important. They change all the dynamics of the sediment and they change it for a, a large number of centimeters away from the organism. And now that we can measure them by both opto techniques and also uh, pressure sensors, uh, we, sh we should be doing so. So sources of bioinfection in, in sedimentary areas, these are, the big, these are the big players that we know about. A number of the thalassinids, uh, basically all the thalinids we've looked at, and, and aranicolid uh, polychaetes. Uh, there, there's a, nereids can be important, as can be uh, terabellids, and I should Really, I'll modify this list is to add some suspension feeding bivalves, not all, but some. And certainly razor clams fall, fall over here. And then uh, there are a variety of organisms that fall over here that are on the lesser scale of hydraulic activity and nests are enormously abundant. And then there are animals that just don't do this. They live in pipes. They have very thick walls to their burrows and they basically do not cause any projection of water into the surrounding sediment at all. So uh, thick walled tubes of, of, uh, of some burrowing shrimp. Um, there are some, uh, some worms such as Di Diapatra that, that do not uh, pump water into the sediment at all. Like you put a pressure sensor right next to a Diapatra and you see nothing, it's really boring. Put one next to an Aranicolid and you see all this dynamic activity going on. Um, and then there's some terabellids that also uh, form these very thick uh, wall tubes. And then there are organisms that, that are bulldozers but maintain the connection to the overlying surface like uh, some hard urchins, batangoids, uh, because they have a connection to the overlying surface with part of their body, it actually sticks out of the sediment often. In that case, they're brewing through the sediment, they're pushing sediment laterally, but in fact, they have no extensive hydraulic activity. The implications are you're pumping water from depth up. You're, that causes heat transfer because the de water at depth is frequently colder than the water on the surface. So you actually can watch this easily with a thermometer and go next to an aeronicolid, put a thermometer on the uh, area where the animal is feeding, there's cold water coming out. Uh, the, uh, during nighttime, it will be the reverse. The, in, it's sometimes of year, especially in places like northern Germany. The, the, uh, uh, the water at depth in the sediment will in fact be warmer than the surface water and you can see hot water coming out. Uh, you have solid transfer, as I said before, transferring to the microphytobenthos out of the sediment to the layer directly uh, attached onto the sediment. You have alteration of the sufficient chemistry of the sediment because now you have this, this low oxygenated water, high ammonium water which is coming out which uh, changes the taste of the sediment, which is likely to change uh, recruitment to a very large, large extent. We've talked about recruitment in terms of se a sediment exposure by feedings, is what terabellids do in, in, in an area, by turnover of sediments. This is a thalassinid bed. We haven't talked about it to a large extent in terms of these sorts of things, but you, know, you look at this layer of water or these plumes of areas of high intensity plumes caused in this place by a uh, by a clam, in this case, these, these cases by an aeronicolid, those sorts of things should change 
uh, recruitment into those local areas, just as we've demonstrated before that sediment uh, turnover changed recruitment. One of the things to remember about those experiments that, that, that uh, we did a long, very long time ago is that, that uh, if you look at recruits on surfaces and you ask, will they accept the surface? How long does it take them to accept the surface? Experiments in little flumes suggest that the maximum amount of time they have to decide is 50 seconds. After that, they get eroded. So that's it. Often it's as short as 10 seconds. So you haven't made up your mind. You haven't put down business. Little clam coming down onto the surface, if they really like it, they immediately put down a business thread. If they're not so sure, they don't. And if they really don't like it, even minutes later, they have no business. Uh, polychaetes do the same. The, so these, these are sediments that, that were low in oxygen concentrations right at the surface because of various manipulations we'd done. And you'll notice that their time is greatly in excess of, of, the, of the 50 seconds or so. Uh, if you replot uh, a different set, of, these are a different set of experiments done for just this reason, ask the erosion question relative to little flume data, you'll notice that, that you know, normal, normal surfaces are somewhere in the 200 plus sort of range for, for, for micromolar concentrations of oxygen. And we're having rejection somewhere around 70 or 80 micromolar. That's, that's well, well above what we talk about as hypoxic and, and stressful environments. That says recruitment is, com, can be completely controlled by these sorts of hydraulic activities and changes in surface sediment taste. So let me stop there. I expect the combination of the two of us has totally overwhelmed anybody's ability to sit still for this long. But the, uh, obviously, we have a, a number of collaborators on, 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 this, on this project, and, and all sorts of people have uh, been kind enough to give, us, uh, to give us money. So thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully that tells you something about why you should worry about uh, a particular kind of per performance metric. Uh, Gonzalo, lucky Gonzalo, has, uh, he has in the lab now um, Heart monitors, turns out bivalve shells are transparent to, to uh, infrared. So you can put an infrared emitter and, and detector on a shell of a bivalve and bounce it all to its heart and get a, and get a heartbeat. And we have actually pretty nice heartbeats going on in the lab. Uh, you can measure whether the shell is open or not in, in the sediment by, by putting uh, magnetic uh, field sensors and magnets on the outside of the shells, hall sensors, and see, see, see the opening and closing. Gonzalo put his first one of those up yesterday and got nice recording data from, from those. Uh, and then he has pressure sensors and I don't know, five, five or six other tinker toys that, 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 that may or may not work. So <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Um, and I don't know what you want to do now. <laughs> As to what's going on in terms of controlling the rest of the assembly. And in terms of organisms on the European coast, two of the organisms that are disappearing from the south are beginning to show indications of that. One is, uh, is, is uh, Aranicla in parts of the Bay of Biscay, and the other is Macuma baltica, a uh, talinid bivalve, which has already moved north out of uh, uh, the southern regions of the, of the Bay of Biscay, as shown by, by uh, the, the Dutch. So here's just examples of, of what you see in surfaces. This is a cutaway slide stolen from Rhodes and Young in the 70s. This is what happens to the sediment when you have increased uh, mobility of bioturbators and increased uh, resuspension going on. Uh, this is the same sort of thing in the, when you have a, a relatively sedentary bioturbator which just turns over sediment. This is what Aranicola or many thalassinids do, for example. Uh, and then you have the sediment stabilizers. This is uh, Lenisi, which you certainly are quite familiar with. This is a Diapatra neapolitana, the tube of it, plus uh, in a zostra bed. These are organisms which are sediment stabilizers, so they're, they're the opposite. So why should I care about uh, hydraulic uh, activities? Well, all macrofauna, all organisms that live in sediments, all their movements are via hydraulic activities. This is how the organisms, uh, this is how they burrow. They inject water into the sediment. 
This is how they live in, in uh, structures in the sediment. Uh, bivalves, for, for example, uh, do a tremendous amount of injecting water into the sediment, both in terms of, of uh, when they blow the, when they clean off the labial palps in front of the mouth, which they do frequently about once to, to a minute to every uh, two minutes. There's a little jet of water that, that comes out of the abyssal gape and goes into the sediment. Uh, what what they are uh, relative, how their relative importance in terms of resource base, uh, in 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 many habitats, a very important description of of an ecological engineer is habitat modification. One of the reasons for looking at uh, Diapatra on the European coast and also, of course, uh, Arenicola, is because they are major modifiers of sedimentary habitats. In one case, they stabilize the habitat. In the other case, they are uh, major. Uh, organisms that turn over huge amounts of sediment in the, into the habitat. And the usual ways in which we look at organisms, particularly in sedimentary habitats, in terms of their role as controlling the rest of the assemblage, which is what all of e the term ecological engineer is supposed to imply, so controlling the rates of, of recruitment of organisms, their success in terms of growth and reproduction, their even uh, perhaps even their their presence at all, but certainly their success in the habitat is, is in terms of these sorts of things. And so in sediments, usually we're talking about increases in the ease of erosion, organisms that do that, organisms that decrease the ease of erosion, organisms that turn over sediments, such as uh, Arenicola, organisms that, uh, that the one characteristic that we typically have not talked about, but we are beginning to talk about a lot, uh, an enormous uh, amount now, is the degree to which there are hydraulic activities associated with that organism. So I'm gonna concentrate in the talk today about performance as a function of hydraulic activity. And the reason for concentrating on that is number one, we're going to do some of that here. So Gonzalo will have pressure sensors in the lab and you can go take a look at these homemade affairs and be not probably very impressed by them, but they're actually yield very interesting data. Uh, but also because it turns out that this, in fact, may be one of the most important characteristics for organisms living in sediment. Okay, so I, I want to, uh, again, thank uh, Elsa and G Gonzalo for uh, a, the very pleasant uh, period of time we've had here and mm -hmm. look forward to our future uh, collaborations with them. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to follow on. David has now set the large stage for, for what the, uh, this question is, is all about. And clearly, we're now at the point at which we need metrics by which we measure performance. Uh, the, the organisms that we've been looking at are all organisms that I would describe as being ecological engineers, which actually is a term that I, I truly hate. But uh, we seem to be stuck with it in the literature, so I'll just deal with it. So ecological engineers are usually described on the basis of how much of the resource for a habitat they, they utilize, how important they are trophically, uh, whether they're uh, in terms of organisms like barnacles, whether they occupy all of the, all of the surface in a particular tidal zone, 